Welcome to the Holy Post. We start off the new year with a mailbag episode where Phil, Caitlin, and I answer your questions. We talk about important decisions from how to pick a church to how to pick a candidate. How do we maintain relationships with people we disagree with? Is it okay to not sing in a worship gathering? We also share some of our favorite movies, what alternative careers we've considered, why I think sermon-centric Sundays are a problem, plus what the alternatives are. Caitlin gives advice to future theology students and explains the difference between biblical studies and theology. And it turns out, Phil really likes menopause metaphors. And this week, for our Holy Post Plus subscribers, we answer more of your questions, including what we think about gender roles when it comes to the Bible, how do we respond to becoming so-called Christian celebrities, and why don't we debate people we disagree with on the Holy Post? If you're not a Holy Post Plus subscriber, why not start the new year by signing up? You'll get access to bonus stuff like I just mentioned, plus exclusive shows like Getting School with Caitlin Chess, live streams, the Holy Post Book Club, and we've got a lot of new stuff coming in 2024 that you're not going to want to miss. So go to holypost.com and sign up today. Here is episode 598. Hey there, it's me, Phil. <laughs> My goodness. Welcome to the podcast. <clears throat> I've been sick. I don't, I can't, I I remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, that even if you don't feel like it, you got to bring the energy, you know? <laughs> I think that was you who said yeah, that, Phil. I know. Yeah. That, was, that was me. Uh, but I really don't feel like it. See, there are levels of don't feel like it. Like, I just don't, I don't have, I don't have that energy it's not accessible right now. I've been sick for a week. My mm -hmm. wife's been sick for a week. Our daughter was sick for a week. Everybody's sick. It's gray. There's no snow for Christmas. Do you have snow, Caitlin, out there in California? No, certainly not. Okay. I know you can't tell us what part of California you're in because it's top secret. Yeah, you're, it is. Yeah, you're on a secret government military installation. You're probably inside a mountain. Are you inside a mountain right now? No, no. Oh. I, <laughs> there I was a like rocket it. that launched this morning. Like, I watched it from my parents' from, backyard. So, Like from the playground down the block? Yeah, yeah. Just happens wow. every day. Oh, look, a rocket. Huh. <laughs> okay. And skies from his normal place with his regular energy. Yeah, now, I, and now I'm <laughs> envious, Sky. I'm envious Phil, of the energy you're allowed to bring every episode. I th I think this show is going to be the first one of 2024. It's like a Happy New Year show, is it? And you're starting off with like this majorly downer, yep. depressing message of yep. of the new year. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for the theme song. <laughs> What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Today's episode is sponsored by Sundays. This is Phil. I have a dog. You have a dog. We love our dogs and we gotta feed them something. Fresh food with human grade ingredients is a better way to treat our dogs than that old bag of whatever that stuff is. Sawdust and cow bones? I have no idea. But fresh pet food is expensive and inconvenient. And that's where Sundays comes in. No, not the day. The new dog food company that makes air dried dog food from a short list of human grade ingredients. It's healthy with beef, chicken, and digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger. It's convenient. Unlike other fresh dog foods, it's zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf stable and ships right to your door. And it's affordable, costing 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because they don't waste money shipping frozen packages. We've got a special offer for our dog-loving Holy Posters. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash holypost or use the code holypost at checkout. That's Sunday sundaysfordogs.com forward slash holy post. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And thanks to Sundays for sponsoring this episode. 
This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. My son just started his career as a marriage and family therapist after training at Wheaton College, where Christian faith and rigorous academics go hand in hand. It's easy around Wheaton, Illinois, to find great licensed therapists that share my faith convictions. But what if you don't live around top-notch Christian therapists? That's where Faithful Counseling can help. With more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states, Faithful Counseling makes it easy to find a great therapist that'll work for you. You can meet over secure video or phone sessions, and changing therapists is easy and free until you find the right fit. Don't struggle alone. Let Faithful Counseling match you with a licensed therapist who can help you grow into the best version of yourself. Visit faithfulcounseling.com slash holypost and get the professional faith-based counseling you need. And there's a special offer for our listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at faithfulcounseling.com slash holypost. Thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. All right, this is a uh, mailbag episode. I'm drinking tea to try to keep my voice because my voice has not been good the last few days. <gasps> mm. Warm and lemony. <coughs> okay, that's good. You can diagnose me from that cough. Um, all the nurses are sending me emails right now. Oh, you should probably be checked out for pneumonia. I was yesterday. I don't have pneumonia. So thank you. I, I good. got that. It's a little good news. Of all the things I might have, pneumonia is, is not one of them. We are, how did it go last week without me, by the way? I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. It was went. It, was it okay? It went. <laughs> yeah. Kaylin, can you give me a more of an assessment that's an assessment? It was good, but uh, me and Sky learned that we are too serious when it's just the two of us together, I oh. think. It was a, we had okay. a lot of opinions. You, you two are together a lot. You do all your Caitlin schools stuff. That's true. Mm -hmm. Those are okay. typically pretty serious. straightforwardly serious. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we had no butt news. We had no animal news. Um it, it worked. I think people tolerated it. Hopefully they're coming <laughs> back. Okay. We'll find out. We missed you, Phil. Well, thanks. That's very sweet. It's, very, it's just very, 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 very sweet. I, I am glad that you were healthy enough to do the live show and that yeah. you're on yeah. the mend. So hopefully you, you have a good Christmas. We're recording this a few days before Christmas, everybody. Yeah. So we we're, get a little bit of a break after We're this. recording this a few days before Christmas, everybody. Um, and then next week, as we're recording this, it's, uh, what are we putting out? Is it the, the live show? The live show thing. Okay, yeah. yeah. And this, so this is after they listen to the live show. Correct. Hey, everybody! Remember all that energy I had? Well, imagine <laughs> I have it now. That's actually where it went because it was that week that I got sick. Mm. It was at the end of that week. Yeah, that, it was a small space with a lot of people, which meant we all probably swapped viruses and germs. Yeah, probably mm -hmm. so. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, Caitlin! Didn't Laughter like the spreads sound of it that. even more quickly. Caitlin, Gross. are you a germaphobe? This is I don't realize I don't know this about you. Not really. I mean, I love kids, okay. so it's kind of hard to be too mm. germaphobe yeah. with kids. That's true. That's true. They're little happy petri dishes. Okay, <laughs> we are answering whose questions? Let me tell you, listener, your questions. Why are we answering your questions today? Because that's how much we care. Mm -hmm. We care so much. With to be our... clear, we're not answering most of your questions because we don't <laughs> care about most of you. Uh, but we only have time what? to answer some of your... I'm joking. No, we only have time to it? answer some questions. So yeah, our, our okay. fearless producer, Mike, has selected the ones that he yes. thinks So if your question answer. doesn't get answered, blame Mike. I wasn't me. I had nothing mm -hmm. to do with it. Actually, though, Caitlin and Sky both went through and highlighted some questions that they thought would be fun to answer. So it's you true. can also blame them. I did not. I did not. I was too sick. I couldn't <laughs> even read. I was so sick I could not read words. Couldn't read words. Okay. Question number one. Don't look at me like that, Sky. <laughs> Question number one from William Parker. Isn't, didn't he manage uh, Elvis? No. What was his name? Oh Tom, Colonel, Colonel Tom Parker. C Colonel Parker. Colonel Tom Parker. Yes. Yeah, with a Dutch so. accent for some reason. Yeah, because he was Dutch, actually, and that wasn't his real name. His whole life <laughs> well, was yeah. kind of a lie. Right. That's true. Okay, go, go to Wikipedia. Uh, 
Caitlin read up okay. about Colonel Okay, wow. Didn't you see the movie? You didn't watch Elvis? No, didn't I didn't. watch the big okay. Boz Lerman. Although you, you have to be a little bit crazy to believe you've learned history from a Boz Lerman film. Because he doesn't really do history. He does musical theater. Did you see Moulin Rouge, Caitlin? Yeah. No. Okay. No. Well, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that was. If you see Moulin Rouge, that is not necessarily an accurate representation of that period Good to of, know. of French history. Good to know. William Parker, not Tom Parker, says: If you all had to pick another vocation other than what you do now, what would it be, and why? I'll, what, yeah, in, I'll, yes. what exactly is it that I do now? Because I'm not even totally, <laughs> totally clear on that. Well, that's my answer. I have no idea what my vocation is. <laughs> so, the, I mean, Caitlin is the only one here with a clear, like, she's on a path to somewhere. Mm-hmm. She's this headed somewhere. Yeah. You're, you're going somewhere. Partly Hopefully. because it's young. you're young, so you're still more at the beginning of what you're going to do with your life and... Sky and I are old, and we're at the end of what we're going to do. See, well, do this is lives. why you should answer this because you have regrets, okay. maybe. <laughs> Ooh, ouch! I can still, I, I can still I, change course. I could. I, I don't know what I do. Um, my, I'm not definitely not a podcaster. Vocational, like as my vocation, that's not what I do for a living. I'm still trying to be a filmmaker. It's just a profoundly difficult uh, vocation especially if you want to make um, Christian films for kids. So uh, if I had to do it all over again, I might try to see if I could write uh, fiction, write novels, maybe. Ooh. Oh. Like maybe, you hmm. know, y- young adult or old old kid chapter book kind of uh-huh. stuff. That might be worth trying. I've I've neglected to try because... I love visuals and music so much that it's hard to say I'm just going to be about words on mm. a, on a page, hmm. and, and I'm not that verbose. And if you're a novelist, you really need to pound out words, <laughs> lots and lots. <laughs> There's nothing else. You got nothing else to go on. Just words. And I just yeah. I did a deal once with Thomas Nelson to do some kids books, and after the first one. Um, and this was back in the early aughts. They said, you know what's really hot right now? Harry Potter. Is there any way you could write something like that instead for your kids' books? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. They're supposed to do like, you know, 300 Just words. Just write Harry kids Potter. Books. Yeah. Do something like Harry Potter. Just that's, do that. That's popular. Okay. Caitlin, first of all, what's your vocation? Would you say theology is your vocation? Yeah, I'm okay. training to be a theologian, want okay. to be a theologian. I think if I was not going to be a theologian, I would probably be a kindergarten teacher because mm. I like teaching and I like kids oh, and I man. like crafts and I like making places look pretty. And so I think that would be fun. Would Would your kids love you? I'm just going on the record <laughs> that your class would just love you. <clears throat> well, that's very nice, Phil. Yeah. What what if the three of us just changed all of our vocational directions and we formed a band <laughs> and we went on the road as a band? No. Mm-hmm. We, we sang, we would write uh, folk, Christian folk songs and we would perform them. It's a hard no for me. Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. Okay. Sky. Um I have changed vocations <laughs> on a number of occasions, so I don't know mm-hmm. if, if I, but I yeah, this I have this is going to sound ridiculous, but I think stand-up comic. Oh. I think that would have been fun to try because I've said this before on the show, but I really think stand-up comics are as close as you can get in 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 our culture to preachers. They're very similar. You know, they monologue to an audience. They depend on that audience's affirmation and and constant support for their ego satisfaction. Most of them have pretty screwed up relationships with their fathers. And heavenly or otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, I think it would be interesting, it'd be fun to try that sometime. I that might have been one of the things I would have said, except I kind of have tried it a little bit. There have been a few occasions where I have tried to put together, you know, I'm gonna do like 20 minutes of just talking and Mm -hmm. being funny, and and it was more, much more stressful than I thought. It's like, (laughs) okay, yeah, this is not. 
that's not fun. That maybe you get to a point where it's fun, but that's ah, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. how long it would take to get to the point where that's fun. It was it's it was, a tightrope. But yeah. the, the other reason yeah. that comes to mind is I I genuinely think there are probably more stand up comics in our culture today who are speaking prophetically about important issues. Yeah. Then there are preachers who have access to the culture and are speaking prophetically about important issues. So hmm. anyway. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Christopher asks, if the next election features two candidates you don't feel consciously comfortable voting for, how do you fulfill your duty to vote? Pick the lesser of two evils. Write someone in, even though it won't make a difference. What do you do? I think we should talk to the political theology expert <laughs> on that question. First of all, but the, he does make an assumption that we have a duty to vote. Yeah. And I don't know if we have a duty to vote. Sometimes we may have a duty not to vote, or at least not vote for a particular oh. mm -hmm. race oh. or election. I don't know. Oh. Oh. Caitlin? Interesting. Mm. Tell him where I, he's wrong. I, <laughs> I, I don't know that I would use the word duty, but I do think a good way to apply something like Romans 13 that talks about the, the kind of authority that is given by God to governing authorities and that we have a duty to obey them, a good interpretation or application of that in a modern liberal democracy is our participation through the mm -hmm. like most significant means that we have of influencing the structure of our government, which is voting. I don't think that that's a law that applies to every person and every time and every place, but I think generally we should see voting as a significant part of our participation in our public life. To actually answer the question, I generally think there is a way for you to kind of evaluate which of these candidates would be better thinking strategically about what a president actually does versus what things they don't do, right? So you can feel safe voting for someone even if they do not kind of check all of your boxes politically. There could be, I'm not going to say it's impossible, there could be a situation in which you just don't think morally you can vote for either candidate. And then I think there are a variety of things that you could do. You could write someone in, you could choose to not vote for president. But I think the more important thing is, and I say this all the time, but I, I just don't think we talk about it enough. I think the more important thing would be to say, okay, if I know both candidates are just so horrifically immoral, I can't vote for them, which again, I don't think that's probably likely in even our, our upcoming election, but it could happen. What really you should be doing is focusing on all of the other things that you vote for that are really crucially important. So spending some more energy on the other local elections, the state elections, and the other national elections that you will vote in, and trying to see if across those variety of places, you can represent the variety of things that you care about. You can take the burden off of needing to find a single presidential candidate that encapsulates all of those things and find a way for both your voting and then a variety of other ways that you engage politically to represent those different things, which is one way of saying, I wish that we asked less what to do in a presidential election because I wish we spent more of our energy, theological and otherwise, on all these other ways that we participate politically. But it's also to say part of the reason I find it unlikely that you will end up in a situation where you just can't vote for either candidate is because I want to lower the expectation that that candidate will encapsulate so much of what you care about. So if you're just making mm -hmm. a strategic intervention at this one level, what happens at the national level? What authority does the president have and what authority does the president not have? It's easier than to say, hey, I'm not voting for this person as my representative of everything good and right and true in the world. I'm exercising this one ability that I have to influence our political system. And because it can't cover all of these things I deeply care about, I will make sure those are represented in my other votes, in my participation in my local community, in the places I volunteer, in the places I get my money. And I can feel like I am being faithful in that variety of spaces and not just like all of my faithful political participation has to happen at the national presidential election. Good answer. Good answer. Um, okay. Couple things. I agree with you, Caitlin. This is what we always do. I agree thing, with you, but. Thing mm. one. What? Hmm? Thing Go. one. Yeah, yeah. Thing Go. one. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree with Caitlin, but I think what his question is really getting at here is presidential elections. Let's be honest. We're in 2024. He's talking about two candidates. Fine. Secondly, he says, what do you do if you don't feel consciously comfortable voting for either candidate? First of all, I don't think you should feel comfortable voting for any of the candidates in my life. Like they all have things that are out of conformity mm -hmm. with our values as followers of Christ. So if you feel entirely comfortable voting for any recent 
presidential candidate, something's probably off in your own assessment. Third, I appreciate David French, I think it was during 2020, wrote a piece about how he assesses candidates. And he talks about a, a hierarchy of, of things, top one being character. Mm-hmm. That if a, if a candidate's character is so deeply flawed that they can't be trusted with the authority and power that their office would give them, yep. that's a deal breaker, number one. After character is competency. Do they actually have the skills and intelligence to do what is required in that job? And if they don't have that, deal breaker. And then only after character and competency are clearly covered, does the third piece come into play, which is policy. Do they actually agree with the things I agree with and the policies they would enact? And that gets to your point, Caitlin, where you have to then factor in the office that they are appealing to. And so when I look at presidential candidates... The Constitution gives the president an enormous amount of of power over foreign affairs and over the military. And that should be weighed disproportionately to, say, budgetary issues or domestic policies in which the president needs far more support from Congress in order to do those things. So um, even in this election in 2024, I am weighing foreign policy issues more than domestic policy issues in many regards because a president has way more unilateral power there than in other areas. So I don't think we've been taught to think that way about these Mm -hmm. offices. We just go, well, do do they conform or not conform to what I agree with? We forget about competency. We forget about character. We forget about weighing these different things proportionally. The other way to decide is to just wait for your church to hand you a voting guide. And then, and then, and then you'll know mm. Mm. what is true and good right call, Phil, and biblical in the world. Okay, <laughs> never. Mind. I was actually going to bring up what David French had said that one time because I found that, you know, just saying policy doesn't matter if they shouldn't be in the job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we we actually saw that a little bit with Trump, where some people voted for him because they agreed with his policy stances back in 2016 or 2020, but then he proved to be so incompetent in his ability to do the job that he couldn't even get done the things he said he wanted to get done. So if you agreed with him on the policy, Mm -hmm. but he can't execute it, what's the point? Yeah. 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 That's where I am too. Okay. Thanks, uh, Christopher. Good question. Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous. uh, Asks, what is your best practical advice for my daughter who's considering a future in biblical scholarship? Oh my goodness. Is Is there a future in biblical scholarship? For, for, For women? <clears throat> yes. Oh, big time. My mm. advice, I because I think this is addressed to me. Right. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this is probably addressed to me. Maybe leave the SBC first and then pursue your career in biblical scholarship instead of trying to pursue it from within the SBC and then having to leave it with much pain and weeping and gnashing of teeth in 20 or 30 or 40 years. Or more like 20 or 30 months. Oh, oh. well, yeah. These are, mm-hmm. these are pessimistic instructions. Mm. <laughs> well, there is, uh, <clears throat> there is there's so much effort within the SBC to clamp down on these women getting out of line yeah. that yeah. it just seems like it's becoming a less and less friendly place for, yeah, I think I'll go to... Um, this, you know, Southern Baptist Seminary and see if I can take the preaching class. Uh, All right, Caitlin, yeah, as someone I, who is blazing this trail, what do Caitlin, you Caitlin, trailblazer, <laughs> Caitlin. I mean, I would say, first of all, I mean, especially if, if I'm talking to a parent who's asking us about their kid, the first thing I would say is is focus on the positives, not just kind of the challenges that she will face, which are there, or the ways in which this is a path that women have not had access to for a long time. Those are all true things. But especially depending on how old she is, I have loved seeing young girls in some of my churches be really excited about the Bible, about understanding it, about teaching it before they've even gotten to some of those challenges. And I wish we sometimes started with the positives of you are made in God's image. You are gifted in certain ways. And I wish that we just start it with those really positive, true things before we get to the challenges. The other thing I would say along Phil's lines is, yeah, sp- spend time figuring out what kind of institutions will support you, where there are not only people who are hypothetically supportive of women, which is a big thing right now. There are lots of evangelical schools that are kind of shifting on this in some ways, 
But pay attention to are there faculty, especially women faculty, who can mentor and support you? Because it's been my experience, actually, that some of the places that are the loud, the loudest in their egalitarianism but are still primarily led by men, there's a lot of subtle sexism that can be real challenges for women in those spaces, even if hypothetically there aren't the explicit barriers that some complementarian places will have. So pay attention to like where women are flourishing, where women can find mentors, where women can find financial support and go to those places. And then like make sure you're in a church where that's true. I think too often women in particular, there's more of a divide between women who flourish in the academy and women who flourish in the church. Whereas it feels like for a lot of men, you can be a pastor with a PhD. You can, you know, dabble in the academy and also in the church. And because there have been limited opportunities for women, there can be a real divide between the women who are serving in the church and the women who are in the academy. And I wish that, like, younger generations would just demolish that divide and say, I really care about doing good, solid scholarship. And I teach Sunday school at my church. And I'm really deeply involved there. And I learn from men and women who didn't have the opportunities I had. I have loved being in a small group and a Bible study with women in my church who are generations older than me, who didn't have access to theological education the way that I did. And I've learned so much from them. And I think overcoming some of those divides is is really important for younger women. Okay. All right. Can I ask a question of Caitlin to follow up on that? Yeah. What, can you summarize for me really simply, what's the difference between biblical studies and Ooh. theology? Yeah, that's a good question. Because technically, I'm not in biblical studies, so this question uh -huh. is a little bit different than me. Uh -huh. um, this is a divide that is fairly recent. This wasn't true historically. If you go back to the early centuries of the church through the medieval period, you'll find lots of theologians, and they were studying the Bible and studying Christian theology. But in the advent of the modern university, where we wanted to cut everything up, okay, now history is separate from social sciences, and now you've got theology separate from biblical studies. Now people are trained separately in those fields. Biblical studies focuses more directly on the text, the literary features of the text, the history of the text, sometimes the history of interpretation, but really generally it's, we are focused on the text, it's historical provenance, it's grammatical meaning, those things. Theology looks at the history of the church, uses theological categories, draws on philosophy and history. And a lot of times in evangelicalism, one of my soapboxes is that we mostly listen to biblical scholars. We don't listen to mm -hmm. theologians because we say we're just Bible people. We just read the mm -hmm. Bible. Mm -hmm. So we might have learned that we need some experts to help us. But we mm -hmm. pretty exclusively listen to the people trained in this one area. Because well, those are the people that study the Bible, Caitlin. Theologians are the people that come up with new stuff. No, no, no. Theologians. Innova we don't want innovations. We don't the want innovations. It's not. I mean, theologians are drawing on ancient categories to help us understand things that go across the canon, that incorporate questions people ask when they've read the text, but go... I don't really understand. How is Jesus both the Son of God and God? How do we get the mm -hmm. Trinity? How do we get mm -hmm. these categories that help us understand who Jesus is? Those are all theological okay. categories. And one of the biggest problems in the modern kind of theological world, I think, is that a lot of people trained in biblical scholarship have erected a wall between studying the Bible and theological categories and terms and history. So you can mm. study the Bible in a lot of institutions today and never really spend time considering the fact that some of these texts have been used for certain theological conclusions for thousands of years. And you're kind of taught to treat the Bible as if it's sort of separate from the church and separate from Christian theology. And a lot of people trained in theology are kind of taught, okay, now you're doing a totally separate thing that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. And I would rather us you know, foster conversations between those two groups of people. It's, it does seem kind of artificial because how do you... Yes. How can you do theology, at least Christian theology, without engaging the Bible, given right. that so much of it is rooted there? But on the flip side, how can you really study the Bible and come to some interpretive conclusion and be ignorant of how that same text has been interpreted throughout church history and maybe even the errors in interpretation and some of the bad things those right. errors lead to would be helpful to know? So that, oh, I'm going to land on this view of the Trinity based on my study of Scripture and not realize that actually led to this unintended consequence 500 years ago that I should probably be aware of so I don't make that mistake again. Right. All right. And that's that's where I promise, Phil, this is the last thing I'll say. Okay. I just want people to be wary when they're reading stuff written about the Bible, when they're reading stuff written by biblical scholars who I love, who are, you know, biblical scholars as a whole, wonderful group of people. But as, as a field... But they're wrong. As a field, 
there's mm-hmm. often been a push to say, don't read any theology into this. Don't bring any theological questions. Don't use any theological terms. And there can be within evangelicalism actually some attraction to that idea because we go, we're just mm-hmm. reading the Bible. We're just reading the words on the, t- yeah. on the page. Right. And I just want people to, to realize there's this whole field that has been doing this work for all of the history of the church that brings great gifts to our understanding of the text. And we should learn from them and listen to them instead of having all of our understanding of Christian theology only come from biblical scholars and not from this rich tradition that we can learn from. Okay. I think we just stumbled on a great Caitlin Shuss quote. They're all wonderful people, but... <laughs> <laughs> As a whole, they're wonderful. Yeah, but... I, no, I just, I just like that. It doesn't you don't even have to identify which group you're talking about. They're all wonderful people. But <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. That question was not from the audience. It was a Phil question. So we mm-hmm. need, to, need to move on. Nick says, assuming a church has sound doctrine, let's just assume that the church mm-hmm. has sound doctrine. What would be your next criteria for choosing a local church to attend? Hmm. Hmm. And how do you even know if the church has sound doctrine? That's my question. But That's a good Well, question we're just assuming that. We're assuming Assuming it. the church has because, sound right. doctrine. Yeah. I heard, uh, who was, I don't know, maybe it was Mike Geary recently talking, giving someone church attendance recommendations. And, and his point was, it's so much about the group of people you are committing to be a part of, you know, that he would even... Emph- de-emphasize to a certain extent, and I may be putting words into his mouth, sorry, Mike, uh, maybe even slightly de-emphasize the importance of whatever doctrine is coming out of the pulpit. That ultimately it's a group of people that you're trying to mm. engage the Bible with. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't listened to that yeah, part okay. of Mike's thing. But, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm misquoting so, him. But you're, I think what you're trying to get at is, is similar to what I would say, which is, again, assuming sound doctrine does does the leadership and the core community of that church display the fruit of the spirit because Mm -hmm. it's not just about having right beliefs it's about having actual communion with christ and his spirit so that they bear good fruit the fruit of his spirit love joy peace patience kindness all that another way of putting it is in scott mcknight's language is is it a toxic church or does it display tove or goodness is it spiritually healthy in its relational right. dynamic. Um, I, when I was at CT and I'd get around and travel, interview pastors and go to well-known churches, it was always interesting to get an inside glimpse because I remember being in one church, which I shall not name, and when the senior pastor would walk down the hall, you could see office doors closing because nobody wanted to interact with that senior leader. And I've been mm-hmm. in other churches That's where the inside. senior pastor is walking down the hall and people are coming out of their offices because they all get a hug, you know, mm. and there's, I mean, that could be creepy too, I guess, but like, it's, uh, but th- there was like a, you can just, you spend yeah. a little time at the, in the inner dynamics of the relationships and you can begin to sense whether there's health here or toxicity. And that for me is a, is a really clear sign of, is the fruit of the spirit evident here, the closer you get to the center of this system. Or does it get more and more toxic the closer you get to the center? Mm-hmm. 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 So what if you have two churches and one of them is a Bible-believing church? We believe and teach the Bible, but everyone's kind of jerks. And then there's another church where they've kind of gone, you know, ah, Bible comes in sometimes, but they're mm. more warm and wonderful people. What do you do then? I don't, well, first of all, that's a false dichotomy. But... The, the, whole bi- the, the whole Bible, the whole Bible believing, quote unquote, Bible believing church that are all jerks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that that's the Pharisees. Jesus says to them in John five, "You search the scriptures because you think in them you will find eternal life, but these are the scriptures that testify about me, and you refuse to come to me." So just because a church says we're all about the Bible doesn't mean they're all about Jesus. It just means they're all about the Bible. And I want to see a church that yeah cares deeply about the authority of the Bible, but is really understanding the Bible is what takes us closer to Jesus, and that's our primary treasure. That's who we're communing with, and that's what's producing the good fruit in us and in our community. And okay. you can't really be very Bible believing and be a jerk. You can believe the Bible in the abstract, but for it to actually exactly. shape your life, you know, oh, from man. the beginning of it to the end, there is a lot said about how we treat you know how people many, made in God's image. Do you know how many people I've had tell me on social media that they're being mean because Jesus modeled it in his interactions? 
mm-hmm. with the Pharisees, and that's why I'm being mean to you right now. So you're saying Jesus was un Jesus like? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to move on because that's also no, not no, one no, of the no, questions. No, no. <laughs> yes, I, Kaylin. I mean, I want to answer your question, but I also think one other important thing to say about the church question yeah. is. I mean, I think it was Eugene Peterson who said you should just start walking and the closest church that you get to, you should start with. And that's not obviously always good for everyone. But I do think the principle there of I am committed to being a part of a community that's actually my community is an important place to start to go. It might be that the closest church to you is doctrinally a mess or really unhealthy. And then that's not the right answer. But I think too many of us are choosing to commute pretty far distances to go to what we think is an ideal church, which doesn't really mm-hmm. exist. They're all going to mm-hmm. be challenging mm-hmm. in different ways. Instead of saying, like, I'm just committed to these people close to me and we will together be committed to our neighborhood and we will care about it as people who have some skin in the game. And I think that's important, too. Yeah. Or another way to put it is one criteria that should not be determinative is how entertaining is the, yes. the service and how dynamic is the speaker and how excellent is the music. And that seems to be what an awful lot of people judge these things on. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we want to know we're, you know, we're getting the most we can for our money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anonymous asks. Anonymous been, is asking a lot of questions. I know anonymous. <laughs> I don't know why they got to is anonymous. Is that that a uh, male or female in the Greek? That's androgynous. It's, it's yeah. Androgynous. <laughs> We didn't get any questions from androgynous. I've been finding it harder to sing during worship, during service, especially when there is baggage associated with some of the source material, EI, it's from Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, etc., or the lyrics seem shallow. Those are two different issues. I find that my engagement in, the, in those times is more quiet, contemplative, but I often feel the social pressure, like I'm not participating in air quotes is my heart just hard to musical worship what place does musical worship have in the life of the believer i don't Mm. let me summarize that question i don't really get into the worship we do at our church am i bad yeah you're terrible (laughs) no no i'm joking because i feel this way frequently yes um caitlin do you want to take this first Uh, Well, I just, I was just thinking this, this last Sunday at my parents' church. It's a more expressive church than I go to. I go to a very Presbyterian, (laughs) we are not the most expressive people church. And I was at my parents' church and I just thought like, this is just not me. Like personality wise, this is just not me. And it was helpful to remember that some of that is a personality thing. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to my Presbyterian church, it's not just people who believe reformed theology. It's a lot of people who like a certain kind of worship experience that is not so expressive and is more heady and academic and we're thinking lots of things i think it's good for us to be stretched so it's been a part of my like spiritual journey has been realizing like i need to get out of my head sometimes i need to Mm -hmm. find ways in which i can be more kind of unguarded in expression um but i don't think it's bad if you just go this is not the way i most connect with god i think it was there's like a c.s lewis i think quote where he says like the most you know communing with god he does is when he's got a pencil in his mouth and a you know thick book of theology in front of him. And I relate to that, of feeling like I have deep moments of reflection and communion with God when I'm working through something at heady and academic. Um, however, there's like real things to be learned across traditions and different expressions, and I think that's a good thing. The last thing I'll say is I really do relate to the feeling of being worried, not necessarily about um, where the music is coming from, because again, I don't go to a church where we sing a lot of Hillsong, But I have had moments when I think, oh, that line, I theologically have an issue with that. Or I Mm -hmm. I don't love that way of expressing things. And I think you have to reflect on when is that something that you really have a serious enough issue with that you're talking to leadership about it or you're kind of choosing to not sing that line or you're and when do you go, I might be wrong. And I, you know, I I sit and hear sermons that I don't agree with every word of and we're together singing this. And as as an act of participation with my community, I will engage in singing this song, even though I might have some questions about if it's exactly Mm -hmm. perfectly right. But there is a line there between when you go, no, this is Mm -hmm. serious enough that I say something. And when is it? That's been the the movement for me lately has been my quibble with this is really annoying. I'm going to choose to interpret this line in the most charitable way. And then I can sing it freely and we can move Mm -hmm. on. (laughs) Um, okay, first of all, I 
it just gets my underwear in a bunch whenever I hear people equate worship with music. Yeah. Right. Oh, the worship time at our church is great. What you mean is the music time was great. Or I'm I'm struggling during worship. What you mean is I'm struggling during the music. Like we have so equated worship and music. Yeah. It just drives me crazy. Like worship is so much bigger than music. I'm not saying music isn't a worshipful thing to do. It's great. But they're just so equated in our imaginations that we think if I don't enjoy or engage emotionally in the music, I'm not worshiping God at all. And C.S. Lewis is idea is a great example of worshiping God through our intellect or through our learning or through many bazillion other things. So I think we just, language really matters and it matters in our church. And if there's a church leader who's listening to this right now, guard yourself against that mistake of equating music and mm -hmm. worship in your language and use of it. That's number one. Number two, um, I, I'm very much like you, Caitlin, where I, I will overanalyze some of the lyrics in the music and get annoyed about it. And, and, and that's just the way I'm wired, too. But um, I, I'm just always been really suspicious of emotional manipulation in religious environments. And I've seen it in different religious environments. Mm -hmm. And music is the most effective way to do that. And so I put up a barrier often in my own heart about I'm mm -hmm. not going to be manipulated into something I don't want to move into. And that's my own problem. You mean problem. closeness to God? Well, no. It's a, <laughs> I, sometimes, yes. Like, there have been yeah. times where I have been sitting in a worship gathering and I am like, I'm really angry and I'm hurt yeah. or I'm mm -hmm. stewing about something with God and I don't want to be manipulated into a feeling that I don't intend to have at this moment. Mm -hmm. Because I think honesty before God is really what Jesus is talking about in in that interaction he has with the Samaritan woman where he talks about God wants those who worship him in spirit and truth. He's talking yeah. about honesty there. But to talk out of the other side of my mouth, and it's on my mind at this time of year because my, my now 19-year-old son was born just before Christmas. And he was premature and had tons of health issues and we thought he wasn't going to live. And it was a really emotional and trying season for us. And I remember sitting, I think it was at a Christmas Eve service or Christmas, I don't remember. And I was just emotionally a wreck. And yet everyone's celebrating and having like this positive Christmassy moment. And I just couldn't sing because I was kind of distracted by everything that was going on with him. But at some point I just made the decision to sing anyway. And it was a case where I allowed my voice to lead my heart. Mm -hmm. And by going into the discipline of singing, even though I didn't feel like it, my heart was led to a more trusting place to um, say what I couldn't yet feel and to let my heart catch up with that. And mm -hmm. it was really good for me to just do the discipline of singing those things, even though I didn't feel them at the moment. And so I'm not giving a formula here, like you should always sing, allow your heart to follow, or you should never sing if you don't feel like it. I think it's about the honesty. I was able to be honest before God in that gathering and say, I'm really struggling right now with all my fears and all my pains. And through singing, I was able to hand that over to him more mm -hmm. fully. So in that regard, it was a positive thing to just shut down the way I felt and engage with the yeah. congregation. There's also something that's been I've been noticing more. I'm old enough that I've lived through multiple generations of pop Christian songs, you know, that were mm -hmm. that became standards in churches for a season of time. So every now and then I'll remember an old song that we used to sing in my childhood church. You know, and, and then wonder, when was that written? Because in, in my mind, it's eternal because <laughs> I grew up singing right. that song. Uh -huh. And then, you know, you realize, no, that was actually written in the 50s. And here's kind of where the church was in the 50s. Or this was a part of, you know, the early 20th century. So it's so many of the songs that are kind of stuck in the back of my head from my early church experience are wildly dispensational, I've noticed, you know, uh. that we're, we're all looking for the rapture and we're, you know, imminent rapture focused and I'm getting out of here, I'm going higher, you know, someday I'll be on that distant shore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's validity to say those songs don't resonate with me anymore because my view of that, I recognize that, that those songs were born out of a specific chapter of American Christianity um, and that every worship song 
is born out of a specific chapter mm -hmm. of American Christianity. So at some point, we're going to look at all these Hillsong and Bethel, um, you know, and Elevation songs and realize, wow, that was so early 2000s <laughs> when, you know, we just wanted to have the feels for Jesus. Um, and it's okay to say I, that was of its time and I'm not there. I'm just not in that time mm -hmm. right now. Or as part of my own maturity, I'm recognizing that these songs or this way we did worship in this season of my life was so culturally specific, you know, and just it just doesn't work for me anymore. And that's OK. You know, and maybe it's going back to really old hymns. You know, let's let's yeah. go way, 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 way back um, or just hum, <laughs> you know, hum and pray, hum and pray. There's there's more that you can do than just sing the songs that were written 10 years ago and mm -hmm. became popular with your worship pastor. And I think every worship pastor kind of hits worship song menopause at some point where they just stop updating their catalog. <laughs> there's like there's no I have no room for like my, my grandfather hit fashion menopause. I remember because he just stopped buying new clothes. There was just no more new clothes. So the exact outfits that he had in 1980 became the outfits he wore until he died in, you know, 2020. Phil. Yes. Okay, hold on. Can we just call that a pause rather than menopause? No, it's like menopause a, because like a, it's, you're, you're, out of, you're out of fresh eggs ideas. <laughs> 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 There's no more eggs. Okay. All right. That's, that's I, it. I'm I, done. I can't have any new ideas about what I'm going to wear. I have all the shirts. I'm, Caitlin, you know there is truth in what I am saying. The metaphor. Uh, yeah. Mm. And, yeah. And, and yet you just don't want to. You just don't want to nod. Mm. You just don't. You're fighting like Sky in a worship service. You're mm. fighting the urge yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to let your heart say there is truth in this. There is truth, mm -hmm. in, but I won't mm -hmm. hold it against you because I'm sure everyone who's listening will write in to tell me they loved my metaphor. El <laughs> Elaine says, for the last couple of years, I've heard you, Sky, speak well, of the church service, which focuses primarily on the sermon and how you think that time could be used differently. I think that it's probably a good idea, but don't know what would replace that time. What do we do with the spot where our sermons used to be? Oh, Sky, slayer of sermons. How, she's not saying that. I'm adding yeah. this. Sermon yeah. slayer. That would be a good tattoo. Um, how would you like to see that time used? Our church is small and doesn't have a lot of breakout rooms, for example, to all go have little discussions for a half an hour. Sky? Hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, I am not anti-sermon in every case. I still preach at places. I have, you know, it's fine. My beef, my beef with the sermon-centric model is that it comes from an era dating back about 500 years where people could not get Bible teaching any other way. They required the most educated person in town to stand up in front of them in a large gathering and teach them the Bible. That's what created the Protestant European form of worship and the Bible and learning the Bible and studying the Bible and engaging the scriptures. All of that is critically important to our formation. Jesus told his disciples to make disciples and teach them to obey everything I have commanded. That's scripture. All that is important. My argument is the best way to do that, I believe, and I think data backs this up, is not necessarily a 30 or 40 minute monologue to a group of passive listeners and that that kind of bible teaching and engagement happens better in dialogue in smaller groups and in relationship and so then rather than structuring our entire communal church life around a lecture of one person teaching you the bible maybe we could use our gathered time and space for other activities that would strengthen the community and strengthen the church now what those other activities look like is your question or what they should be I think it depends on where you are. It depends on your congregation. It depends on your community. It depends on the needs there. I mean, there might be a, a, a case to be made that we should take that 30 minutes and use it for small group engagement and prayer and hearing from one another. Another could say we should use that 30 to 40 minutes to go out in the community and serve people and care for the poor and the homeless. I don't know. I mean, that's where leaders in any given context need to discern together with the help of God's spirit what do we do with the resources we have been given, which includes time, 
money, leadership, buildings, space. What's the best allocation of those resources to build up the body of believers into maturity? I don't have an answer for that. Every community and every leader should be dealing with that question in their context with the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying we shouldn't by default assume that a 30-minute lecture is what God wants every community to be doing every gathering for the building up of his people. What if we changed it to 30 minutes of aerobic activity? Hey, in some community that might be needed. (sighs) I'm joking. I don't know. Caitlin, I, in some I, in in America, uh, I think it's universally needed. Caitlin, I don't disagree with Sky. Oh, that's politic. Gently I, put, here it comes. I I just don't want anyone to hear in what he just said something that I don't think I don't think you intend, mm. which is like we are reinventing the wheel here. Like we just Mm-mm. have to come up with something ourselves. And I always, we've talked about this before, but I do worry sometimes when we say rely on the Holy Spirit, what some people think is like, in my own head, I just come up with my own stuff mm-hmm. that no one's ever thought of before because the Holy Spirit's directly giving me new revelation. Mm-hmm. We have so many resources. We um, do. And to your point, even during and after the Reformation, it had not been the model that a church service was primarily, definitely not exclusively about the sermon, in part because there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we have to get through. Like I think about my church, our sermons are usually 20 minutes and our services are like an hour 15, hour and a half, because we have all this other stuff we have to do. We have to right. we have to receive the Eucharist, which takes a while and is a beautiful, like I, I cannot imagine now ever going back to a denomination or tradition where we do not receive communion every week. It is, it is us receiving Christ's blood and body given to us, nourishing us spiritually. Like I can't imagine not having that every week, but we confess on our knees every week and we hear the good news of the gospel that we have been forgiven by grace of God. We spend time greeting one another. We spend time sharing prayer requests. Like my church is not so huge that it's inappropriate for someone to stand up and say, my dad has cancer and we need to pray about it. Or I have a new foster kid in my family and we need some resources. And so we can pray and also provide resources like tangibly, materially to those people. So I just think if someone is in a position in a church where they're going, we don't want the 45 minute lecture, let's shorten that. What do we do with that time? I'm not opposed to going out into the community. I'm not opposed to having small groups, but you could do that in other contexts as part of your communal life as well. There are so many other things that have traditionally, historically been a part of Christian worship that now that I have them every week, I can't imagine not having them every week. And one of those, not just you know receiving communion every week, but I really can't tell you how much it has shaped my life over the last couple of years to get on my knees every week and repent and to watch the pastors that I am trusting to lead our congregation get on their knees and repent. Like there is something about that that shapes a community, even to the point of I had a kid a few weeks ago in Sunday school asking about why we do that and having an opportunity to say, all of the grownups in that room make mistakes. All the grownups in that room have to ask for God's forgiveness and we receive it every week. We're not, you know, irredeemable people who have to kind of, you know, just constantly prove that we're evil worms, but we we recognize that every week we do wrong and we need God's forgiveness for it. And for them to see that the leadership of our church finds that important and thinks that that's not just for the congregation, that's for the leadership. All of that I have found so important and formative for our community. And so I would just, that's all just to say, there are things in our history that we can return to. I'm glad you added that, Caitlin, because it is a very important point. I wasn't trying to argue that just throw away the past and figure it out new and innovate everywhere you go. But, and I too, if I were going to be a part of a church from scratch, would probably gravitate towards one that draw from those ancient liturgies and traditions. And here, here, last point on this. I don't care what kind of church you're a part of. Every church is sacramental. Yes. Meaning every church believes that the presence of God is encountered somewhere in the gathering. The only question is, what do you believe is the mediator of God's presence? Now, in a highly liturgical church like yours, very often that is seen as the communion table. The elements of you know the bread and the cup are where we encounter God's presence. Even in non-liturgical churches, though, for some of them, it's I feel God's presence through the music, right? And everything Mm -hmm. becomes about the musical performance. In a lot of evangelical churches, the presence of God is mediated through the personality of the preacher, which Mm -hmm. is why that the pulpit becomes the centerpiece of it. And I find it to be generally unhealthy, both for the preacher and for the congregation, for that person to be the mediator of God's presence. 
I think it's dangerous on multiple levels, which is why I tend to be drawn more towards models that don't put that on a single person or personality or performance. And um, yeah, so all this is to say leaders need to discern what's most formative for building up disciples in this place. And what do I have to draw from in my resources or our resources to do that, whether that's history, literature, liturgy, space, the scriptures, all that stuff. Too many of us just default to it's got to be a 30 minute sermon. Okay, we solve that. Moving Mm -hmm. on. Tim says, I'm a pastor. And for years, I'd always heard about the distinction between primary and secondary doctrines. Often, but not always, people would refer to the creeds as being primary. But somewhere along the lines in evangelical circles, issues regarding gender roles as well as sexuality seem to get added in as primary beliefs. Did this happen organically? Or has it always been implied and now it has to be stated? The reason I ask is because it seems like so many today view it as a position in which if you disagree, then you can't be a real Christian. Is this a modern invention based on current culture wars? Truly curious. Tim. Mm. Love Tim. Thanks, Tim. So things seem to be now primary that weren't or were always primary and we just we just took them for granted that you know no one would ever question what our gender roles should be or you know sexual norms should be and and so what's what's going on this sounds like a question for a theologian we don't we don't she hasn't we done don't her dissertation she yet. hasn't arrived yet no uh, she hasn't done it <laughs> she's still blazing I, that trail i I do. I, th- I think this is a very perceptive question because um, yeah. there are. There's this constantly shifting. We're we're negotiating where those lines are. I do think the primary, secondary, tertiary model is helpful in part to say there are things that I do think you have to believe to be a Christian. Then there are things that I think rightfully make sense to, to kind of distinguish churches over. You have to make decisions about who you baptize. Is it babies? Is it adults? Is it professing believers? What do you, how do you baptize? Is sprinkling okay? Does it have to be immersion? Like there are questions that like functionally probably will divide denominations, churches, traditions. And then there's ones that I think people within the same church should be able to disagree on and still be in real community with each other in spite of that. I, to, to the point of the question, I think part of this has to do with a lot of evangelical churches moving away from attention to the creeds. So when you don't have this sense of, hey, we have a historic document that throughout great change and around the world and different contexts and cultures, we have said these are the non-negotiables. We hammered that out under serious duress over the early years of the church to figure out this is ultimately what we most foundationally believe. And then other things are secondary or tertiary issues. When you don't do that, when you're not in a church context that either talks about the creeds, repeats them every week, or even if you're in a church context that is suspicious of the creeds or says no creed but the Bible, we just read the Bible and we don't have anything that kind of unites us, then you have to be in a position where whatever the hot button issue of the day is becomes just by default the thing that distinguishes you. And that's true We just kind of pick up whatever the metrics are in other contexts, right? It's not just churches, it's institutions, universities, et cetera. They have issues of sexuality, of gender roles, et cetera, that those are the things that divide different groups of people. So we just replicate that. One of the ways that we could really distinguish ourselves is saying like, those are important questions. And I do think they really are for Christians to think well about. And they do often divide our churches, again, for practical reasons of like who you marry and how you determine who can lead. And those are questions that make sense for churches to be distinguished over. But if we're not spending time reciting or studying the creeds, of course, we're going to have to find something else to distinguish over because we have to. Okay, but uh, that's a good point, Caitlin. But even like I've been a part of organizations or denominations or ministries that affirm the creeds, but then they also have like their own statement of faith. Yeah. And, And what's interesting there is sometimes there have been elements of those statements of faith that we forget that these statements are historical documents that Mm -hmm. they are rooted in history in a time and a place and like the one that comes to mind is i've been a part of multiple organizations or ministries that had some statement about the imminent return of jesus and there was internal debate about whether or not to maintain or eliminate that statement and as you dig into it you realize oh that didn't occur that wasn't added until early in the 20th century And it was added early in the 20th century because it was symbolic of a big debate that was going on 
in the Christian subculture that was a signifier of what you really thought about the Bible. And, and then in another case, I was recalling an organization, denomination, whatever, that was trying to revise its statement of faith, and they wanted to add something in that would have made a young earth creationist reading of Genesis normative for everybody. And you're like, historically, over the 2,000 years of the church, that has not been a doctrinal issue that people would divide over. But suddenly, in 21st century sections of North America, people are fighting about that, so they want to put that in to the statement. So I think his question is also getting at, like, why do we eliminate certain topics as divisive like baptism, but we insert new ones like role of women or young earth creationism or, you know, pick your controversy of the day. And it's just a helpful reminder that our our statements of faith are often rooted in the the controversies of the day rather yeah. than in the historic core of the faith. I, I think another important part of this that the question is getting at is the kind of history of denominationalism in the Christian church, but especially in the United States. There's this fantastic book called The End of Theological Education by Ted Smith, who's a theologian, um, about how there was kind of a shift early in America's history from what he calls a standing order model of the church, a certain configuration of the church and the state, but also kind of an assumption about hierarchies and, and what people's obligations to their communities were that shifted to a voluntary society model for most of American history. And part of what happens in that shift is if the way you're conceiving of the community you belong to is I as an individual opt into this, I choose the people that are most like me to affiliate with, I don't, as has been true you know, in Christian history in the past, I'm not just born into a denomination. You're Catholic or you're Protestant because of where you were born and who your family is. And that was tr that's been true for a lot of the history of the church that, you know, you didn't see yourself as choosing an expression of Christianity or a particular kind of church or any, you know, a whole range of things about your identity. You didn't see yourself as choosing those things. You saw them as given. You were born in a certain place. This is who your family is. This is your community. And most of the history of the American church has been a history of us seeing ourselves as choosing the society that we want to belong to. And when it's all up to kind of us to choose who best expresses who I am, of course, you're going to start having the dividing lines be a whole range of issues that most Christians in the past and even today would probably say are not primary issues. But if what happens is I say, hey, I belong to this church and people understand that to mean I have affiliated with this with these people because they express who I am. Right. You can't belong to a church where there's a diversity of opinions about certain things because this has to represent everything about who you are. And that's a model of thinking about church that that I don't think is really faithful to how the church is supposed to be, but it's yeah. how we've been shaped to think about church. It's very consumeristic. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so summarize it for me. How do I know which are the primary issues? Apostles' Creed. There you go. Just just Apostles' Creed? No. I mean, Nicene, Nicene Creed and Apostles' Creed, but I like the Apostles' okay. Creed better because it talks about Jesus going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to qualify that for people who aren't familiar <laughs> with the Apostles' Creed. Well, Sky and I spent a whole Getting Schooled episode on mm -hmm. Jesus' descent to the dead and the harrowing of hell, so you could listen to that. But the both of them are very similar in outlining the you know basic foundations of the faith. But the Apostles' Creed okay. does include a line about Jesus descending to the dead. Which one of them is more clear that men need to dress in masculine ways and women need to dress femininely? Neither of them. But it's, mm. the, it's God's created order, so it's assumed. God. Uh, maybe by you. <laughs> well, don't God, you think... God gave Adam dockers, and he gave Eve what? a lovely calico dress. What? Sky? It, isn't, this, isn't this related, though, to sort of the fundamentalist idea that, that all, if all Scripture is authoritative and given to us by God, then all Scripture carries equal weight. And therefore, if I can interpret it that men should be wearing pants and women should be wearing skirts, then that has to carry as much emphasis yeah. as believing in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, which Scripture also teaches. And we've kind of flattened the yeah. authority so that right. we we're have non hierarchical. No way, right. Yeah. Except for men being on top. So well, okay, um. we're highly hierarchical while flattening the authority yeah. structure. Oh boy, mm -hmm. that's a mess. Okay, we're gonna do a couple more here and then we're gonna do a few more just for our Holy Post Plus subscribers. So hang on. Next question from Michael. What typically non-Christian movie do you think every Christian needs to watch and why? 
typically non-Christian. I'm having trouble with that term. <laughs> Obviously, typically. I talked about this, I think, in the last episode we recorded, Caitlin. Oh, yeah, you? you did. You did. Apart from the Bible, all truth comes from the Godfather movies. Right. So I need to watch oh. them, apparently. Yeah. Well, the third one is eh, the first two for sure. So okay. um, like I mentioned, keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. Totally true. Like sometimes we, we can't discern who our enemy really is because yeah. they're so close to us. One I use with my kids all the time, leave the gun, take the cannoli. Meaning, I do like that. Yeah, when, mm-hmm. when you encounter something that's a mixed bag, take what's good, leave what's bad. Okay. Right? Um, sure. uh, it's not personal, it's business. True. Yeah, so you're Very just true. saying you, you get good fortune cookie quotes yes, out I of do. that movie. So I that's do. your favorite movie. It do. doesn't mean I need to watch the movie. I just need to look no, read but your like, fortune cookies. You can apply these things. They're just there's so much great. Yeah, that quotes doesn't mean I have. need to watch the movie. Alright, whatever. I don't there's, need to watch that movie. Mm, there's lots of good I, movies that Christians So many should watch. most of the best movies are stories of redemption. And you know, any really compelling story of redemption I think is Christian in its nature so you know and I love quirky little weird movies like Lars and the Real Girl or Stranger Than Fiction Stranger Than Fiction is a really fun mm. but you know there's little movies that you probably haven't seen I don't like Marvel movies I, I just have I've lost all interest in giant movies they're they're like companies more than stories so I'm no longer interested. And they're not making as many of the smaller movies because it's, you know, that the people that were good at that are mostly working for Netflix or Apple Plus right now, making mm. TV shows instead. So it's a tricky world. What would you recommend? I also, I love the film Millions by Danny Boyle. Yeah, that's a good um, one. About the little boy who talks to Catholic saints. They appear to him and he talks to them while he's trying to give away a million dollars that he they found that f- he thought it came from God, but it fell out of a train when a bank robber threw it out the window. So, Caitlin, you'd love that movie. You should watch that. <laughs> you would. I just looked yeah. it up. I'm excited. You would. Do, do you have a movie, Caitlin, that you think is like worth watching? Well, I was trying to think of a movie that I like that also felt like relevant for Christians to, you know, think theologically. But the the first one, I did not think about this for very long, but the first one that came to mind was um, Hunt for the Wilder People. Mm. Have either of you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taika Waititi. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yes. I just, it's like very sweet. There's a cute kid Mm -hmm. in it, but also to Phil's point, it's just like a story of redemption. And there's, it's, yeah, yeah, I cry Mm -hmm. multiple times throughout it. And it's also hilarious and sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's one other one. Have either of you seen The Big Kahuna? Yeah. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's it's actually a f- film adaptation of a stage play, um, but with Danny DeVito and Kevin Spacey, and I forget who else is in it. Um, it shows it's it's um, three characters from a company that sells like industrial lubricants, and they're at a convention for a weekend trying to to land the big kahuna the guy they really mm. want to sell to and who of them can find him and get 10 minutes with this guy and they have a young kid that's working with them for the first time and he turns out as a born again christian and he's the one who ends up sitting next to the big kahuna <laughs> at, a, at a meal and instead of pitching him the industrial lubricants he pitches him jesus and he witnesses to him and the Kevin Spacey older character goes ballistic on the guy. And there's the most extraordinary mm-hmm. monologue by Danny DeVito to this young kid about you're just selling something too, just like the Kevin Spacey character. You're yep. both just selling something. You know, it's just that you think yours is better than what he's selling, but he's a good man trying to do his job. Um, it's fascinating. And it's, yep. you know, for how does, how does, the world what do we look like to the world when we're mm. treating jesus like a product that we're selling interesting have yeah. you have either of you seen chocolate yes with johnny depp yeah johnny depp and I forget her name yeah uh, i Julia think ormond yes i think that yeah. is who it is i i always saw that movie as a really interesting exploration of law versus grace mm. and and uh, yeah it's, it's 
yeah, I won't go further into it, but so there, oh gosh, we, if I had prepped more for this, I probably could have come up with 10 movies that are That's too really, many. I know, but he asked for one. Mm-hmm. Can said, I, what? can I, can yes. I say one more that is kind of gross and creepy? Uh-oh. Um, mm-hmm. Have either of you seen Mother? No. no, it's Darren Aronofsky and yeah, uh, Jennifer really Lawrence is the main. It is deeply disturbing. I like scary uh-huh. movies. It's really kind of disturbing, but okay, truly, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Oh, I love. I really love cheerful movies. Caitlin. I, cheerful Caitlin of the babies. I'm no, I surprised. Love them. Okay, it, but that movie, the most disturbing part of it is basically a disturbing take on the gospel like it is it is very explicitly a recounting of the christian gospel in a really kind of disturbing way but in a way that i think is so kind of shocking and you know it's like the idea of apocalypse like it's so disturbing but then you also kind of see something fundamentally true about the christian gospel in it Mm. it was not Mm. i have not met a lot of people who've really loved it but i really like it (laughs) what about shawshank redemption Shawshank? That has redemption in the name. Exactly. So it has to be Christian. It's totally Christian, even though it was written by Stephen King. Well, he's, okay. he's like Catholic adjacent or something. Okay, we'll do one more question here, and then we'll do a couple more for Holy Post Plus. Folks, so this is last question. Last question, and this is important because of the year we're going into. How do members of the cast, I think that's us, because we're going to have a cast party after this. Maintain relationships with friends and family members who may have different views from you when it comes to social, cultural, and political issues. Family members or friends that have different views, how do you maintain your relationships coming into the season we're coming into? Hmm. Caitlin, go. Ah. I mean, I've said this before on the podcast, but I do think it can be really helpful when there is someone that you have this deep disagreement about. And I'm especially thinking of political things, right? We're entering an election year. You have deep disagreements about who to vote for for president or what party is you know, better to generally associate with or certain policy questions you disagree on. I have found it to be really helpful to partner with those people in work that is common ground areas for you. So I'm thinking of my church. Um, I'm lucky that, I mean, I have disagreements with my family, but I, I'm really thankful that I'm not in a family that has like really, like where politics is the dividing thing and we don't speak about it. And it's really, but in my church, that's really hard. It is a real dividing question for a lot of people. But I think partnering together on things that we do find common ground on, not just talking about those things, but actually working together on something, having a shared experience that we can remember that kind of cements something in a relationship. I think is really helpful. And I think that could apply to families too. A lot of the big questions that divide us are pretty abstract ideas that we might have different positions on or we identify ourselves different ways. But sometimes when it comes to really practical things in our communities, we can find things that we can work together on or that we can agree on. And I think building a relationship that includes that kind of work, I think can be really important to set a foundation for other things. Okay, Mm. okay. Um, my family, extended family, is all over the map, both literally and figuratively. And, it, you know, there goes from uh, supporters of AOC to MAGA hat wearing folks you know, and everything in between. And when stuff kind of went down, you know, post-Trump election, uh, and we were all connected on Facebook for the first time. So I, like I, we could see what our cousins were saying. And even if they were, you know, we, we only saw them once a year. We could see what they were saying on a daily basis. And, and we could respond. And, you know, my, my siblings and I um, probably spent too much time trying to very gently, kindly show them that they were wrong. And that was not very productive. And after a few months of that, my brother was probably the one who wised up first, um, and then my sister, and then maybe eventually me, um, that it was much more important to show them that they were loved than to Mm. show them that they were wrong. And because we had tried to show them they were wrong, they no longer felt loved by Mm. us and that we'd kind of broken a connection. So we probably spent two years trying to reconnect, reestablish connection, you know, by just 
reaching out multiple times a year to say hi, to ask how you're doing, you know, and then and then just commenting on lots of their posts that had nothing to do with politi mm -hmm. politics. You know, oh, great to see your kids. They're looking great. Congratulations on the whatever. So just showing up over and over and over and over again with no corrective agenda is absolutely vital. And then maybe there'll be a, an opening at some point, but maybe there won't. And that's okay because you can't, there's only so much you can do beyond love, which is doing a lot. That's my point of view. Sky, you got anything to add? Not much more than that. I mean, uh, I've shared before, my family, my extended family is is very diverse and very religiously diverse. I mean, I got Hindus and atheists and Jews and Catholics and Protestants and evangelicals and nominal Christians and lots of Cubs fans. And like, there's, and there's, it's just a very diverse group of people. And I think because I've always had that, there's never been real unanimity around mm -hmm. anything in my family, culturally, ethnically, religiously. There's always been this basic tolerance and understanding of we're we're coming from different places and we have different points of view on things and yet we love each other and we get along so when all the more recent crap hit the fan around politics and and cultural issues i think we kind of were already equipped to not expect everybody to agree and but for me um i i think it's just really important that i hold my views and beliefs strongly enough that they're i don't get defensive when they're challenged mm. i talked to david french about this on most recent french friday like people who get really up in arms when a when an idea is shared that challenges their own it's usually evidence of fragility in their ideas rather than security so if we're really secure in our most core beliefs and convictions then it shouldn't be threatening when somebody disagrees with us or somebody is you know provokes uh, an alternative thought if anything it should provoke curiosity like oh explain me to me more why you think that so if i don't get defensive it usually means other people don't get defensive if i don't put up a barrier they don't put up a barrier so as far as i can control my own attitude and posture i try to not get defensive realizing whatever they believe or hold is not going to ruin my beliefs or my convictions and let's just dialogue openly about it and help me understand where you're coming from um so that right. it's most effective with people who aren't trying to beat you over the head and win you in an argument but most of my family aren't like that yeah yeah okay thank you so much it's been a great it was a great year that we're wrapping up as we record this and that you're beginning as you <laughs> listen to this um and we'll be back next week with more thanks for coming along bye the Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.